We're going to talk about Asian rhinoplasty. Again, rhinoplasty is a medical term that describes cosmetic enhancement of the nose. The Asian nose is very different from the Caucasian nose in many respects. First of all, the tip tends to be a little bit flatter, a little bit wider, a little bit less what we call definition or the ability to see any kind of discernible shape in the tip, and the bridge tends to be flatter. The internal parts of the nose are also quite different. The cartilage tends to be a bit flimsier, a bit thinner. The outer skin tends to be a bit thicker. And for all these reasons, the strategy to help an Asian nose is very different from a Western nose in many respects. We're going to go ahead and break down the nose really into three components. The tip of the nose, the sides of the nose, and the bridge of the nose. And we're going to talk about each of the components and how I usually enhance each of the components and why I do so. For the bridge of the nose, I tend to like to use Gore-Tex implants or thin sheets of Gore-Tex which allow me to achieve a very smooth result along the bridge for augmentation. Gore-Tex doesn't slide. It also tends to integrate well into the tissues, so it's much lighter in, in quality. And it's opaque, so there's no see-through effect, unlike silicone. In the past, I used to do a lot more silicone implants, but had a few problems with silicone implants shifting downwards due to the weight. The Gore-Tex is really designed principally just for the bridge, for the bridge enhancement. As far as the tip is concerned, I like to use cartilage. Now, the reason I don't use cartilage for the bridge is several fold. Number one is the fact that there isn't enough soft cartilage in the ears or nose to create a smooth augmentation of the bridge. In terms of using rib grafts, I think the nose becomes much harder after a rib graft, and I like a softer contour to the nose. Plus, over time, there's a chance of that graft to warp. In terms of the tip, what I like to use is your own cartilage. Most often, uh, I use, if it's, it's a person that's not had previous rhinoplasty, I'll use the cartilage that's found from inside the nose, from inside what's called the septum. The septum is the, a partition that divides both sides of the nose. I don't hurt that at all. I just harvest a little bit, bit of cartilage, uh, and you'll never know it's even gone. That cartilage I use to reconstruct the tip. That that cartilage is very important because the type of a tip graft that I use in an Asian is very different from a Caucasian. If I use the standard reduction techniques that I do on a Western nose, oftentimes it actually develops more scar tissue in the tip and your result is worse off because the skin that's thicker tends not to settle down uh, well. And you can develop scar tissue in between the skin and the, and the reduced cartilages and, and it makes a result maybe not as good as it could be or maybe even worse. For that reason, I tend to like to use various types of tip grafts that are very well supported in the Asian nose and very poorly tolerated in the Caucasian nose. I almost never use a tip graft in the Caucasian nose. So again, I use your own natural cartilage in the tip to redefine and re-sculpt that tip. In terms of the sides of the nose, most Asians walking in my door are very uh, concerned about how wide their nose looks. They think it looks flat and it looks wide. And part of my objective is to understand facial balance and nasal balance. What makes a nose look good and natural and beautiful and attractive is that every component of the nose works together in harmony, and the nose also works in harmony with the face. What I mean by that is that if the bridge in particular is very small, it will make the tip look big just by the absence of something next to it. The best example for me, for you to understand this is if you think of a photograph of a glass of water that's suspended in air and you don't have any other visual references as to the size of that glass of water, you can't tell me how big it is. But if I put adjacent to it something very, very large, a large glass of water next to it, your eye will say, hey, that other glass of water is very small. It's an optical illusion. And the same thing is true if I switch out that big glass of water for a very tiny one, then that first glass of water looks very big. And that's essentially how the nose works. What I notice oftentimes is I have to make sure that the tip and the sides work together in addition to the tip and the sides working with the bridge. 
If the tip is very wide and the sides, even though they look wide, are very small and I reduce the sides too much, the tip will actually look bulbous and big. So the real goal is to make sure that all three components work together. I do use digital imaging to, during my consultation to explain to you exactly what you and I would want to do. And it's, it's a good way to establish dialogue and establish realistic expectations um, and aesthetic expectations of what you desire. In terms of the procedure itself, I do an open rhinoplasty technique. There's a tiny V incision in here. I've never had a scar down here that I had to correct. It tends to heal very, very well. Now on the flip side of that, in the air area right here where the reduction occurs, because it can lead to a visible line for quite some time, I'm more cautious in performing this procedure unless you're cognizant or knowledgeable about the idea that this incision line will, may, will probably stay red or a little bit darker for a longer period of time, maybe even on the order of a few months. Now obviously camouflage makeup can help with it, but it may stay st still stay visible. In terms of the procedure itself, it's, uh, I do this under general anesthesia. Uh, it's a very safe procedure since it's, it's performed with a very controlled environment. Everything is done on my on-site surgery center. The procedure le itself lasts about an hour and a half to two and a half hours, usually in the morning. Um, you will have a splint afterwards when I'm done. Um, which you keep on for the week, just like in a standard uh, Western rhinoplasty, if you will. Uh, the sutures come out and the splint comes off at a, at a week. Um, in terms of uh, the reduction here, I want to mention one more thing that I forgot to mention. The way that I, I reduce the sides here is I use what's called a sheen flap. What's so important is if you look at Michael Jackson's nose, for example, you see a point of cutoff right at the base. And that's because the doctor cut right through into the nasal vestibule, inside the, the hole of the nose. And that cutoff, that abrupt transition zone right here, makes that result look unnatural. I always preserve the inner curvature of the nose. And that's very important so that when I do do a reduction of this structure called the ala, it will look natural afterwards. Let me tell you a little about the recovery time. There usually is very little to no bruising. And in most cases, I don't even see bruising. If I do see bruising in about seven days, I will use my laser to, to soften the, the, the bruising by a significant margin. The first week after the procedure, there will be some swelling. But also remember, you have a splint on for the majority of that week as it is. So showering, you need to be careful when you shower. Um, you just want to keep the splint dry. There is no packing in any type of rhinoplasty I do. You don't get something put into your nose. That's important. Um, so there's no discomfort. Uh, because I harvest some septal cartilage, for the first couple days there'll be a little bit of drippage, and then I, get, and I give you all the supplies for that, and after the first two days, that pretty much stops. In terms of the way you look, in terms of the time you need to take off from school or work, you will have some degree of swelling at the end of your seven days it usually is not significantly deforming. I have a lot of people go back to work at the end of the first seven days. It takes, in my opinion, about two weeks for almost all the deforming swelling to go down. But in terms of the evolution of swelling, and I'll show you that in my photographs to sort of walk you through visually, it really takes about a full year for all the little swelling to go down. And I follow you very carefully over a period of that time to make sure everything's healing well and see if there's any fine, uh, small office-based adjustments that need to be made, but which is pretty rare. But generally speaking, it's about a week off from work. If you wear glasses, I want to be careful with the rhinoplasty because the weight of the glasses afterwards can cause a little mini indentation. And I ask you to, pre I prefer you to wear contacts afterwards if possible. Um, and also to be very cognizant of the weight of the glasses. If I see something with the weight of the glasses coming down, taping the glasses up to the forehead can also be a, a good maneuver to help with that as well. And that's basically what to expect with the rhinoplasty for the procedure, some of the aesthetics, as well as the recovery time. I hope that I was able, I was able to explain to you exactly what I do.